Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Dale. And I'd also like to thank Cynthia Schultz and the entire Center for Asia Pacific Studies uh, at the USF. I'm so glad to, to be here tonight and to have the opportunity to talk to, with you about my book. So let me share my screen now so that you can all see my slides. All right, so um, as Dr. Dale just said, the title of my book is Mapping Digital Game Culture in China from Internet Addicts to Esports Athletes. So over the summer, headlines about Chinese government's new restrictions on internet games were everywhere. Some of you may have seen them. On August 30th, China's National Press and Publication Administration announced that minors those under the age of 18 would be restricted to just three hours of gameplay per week. More specifically, they could only play one hour per day between the hours of 8 and 9 p.m. on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Now, in covering these restrictions, the English language press has emphasized what many in the West already see as a clear tension in China. It's the tension between official and unofficial culture, between government control and individual freedom. So today I hope I can complicate this overly simplistic interpretation and shed some light upon why the government's decision is more complex than this control freedom binary would suggest. However, before I do so, I would like to first explain how this particular framing very much influenced my own point of entry into this line of research. So my interest in studying digital game culture in China in many ways began when I was just an undergraduate studying abroad in the early 2000s. Back then I was a student in Georgetown School of Foreign Service and like many of the students and faculty around me, I optimistically and very naively saw the internet as an inherently democratic force. Something that was going to change China, presumably for the better, and that would create the kind of free flow of information that is often prized as the cornerstone of democratic societies. And so with this in mind, one of my very first research projects saw me darting in and out of internet cafes in the frigid northeastern city of Harbin, hoping to encounter political activists as they gathered and spread information through the power of this new global communication technology. Now, uh, much to my dismay, what I found was a sea of hundreds of teenage boys playing Counter-Strike. And as I sat in these cafes, disappointed as an undergraduate by the fact that I hadn't uncovered some sort of online rebellion, I became troubled by the ease with which I discounted games as mere play devoid of politics. MIT media scholar Jing Wang, who unfortunately uh, recently passed away, long worried about the binary of official versus unofficial culture that dominated the Western fantasy about China. This official versus unofficial binary manifests in the tendency of Western media and scholars to reify the divisions between the state and the people, creating simplistic models of total domination and complete resistance. Jing urged scholars to resist such binary models noting that the Chinese people have more choices of agency than being victims or martyrs. In my book, I therefore intentionally distanced myself from broad speculation about the emancipatory potential of internet in order to examine the very particular ways in which young people use digital games in their everyday lives. Now, I cannot pretend, nor do I wish to give the impression that my study represents the totality of gaming in China. Indeed, that would be a fool's errand. As of February, 2021, the China Internet Network Information Center reported that 531 million Chinese citizens play online games. If we look solely at youth, statistics show that over two thirds of youth play. Simply put, China is home to a nation of gamers. And when I first turned to the study of digital gaming in the cafes, uh, as I was an MA student by that point, I was admittedly overwhelmed by the vastness of this topic and uncertain where to begin. I was not a gamer myself. And so I often summarize my research by stating that I was studying internet games, Wang Luo Yoshi, in China. 
This, of course, was a gross oversimplification, but it was an accurate description in that my initial field site, the Internet Cafe, was a place where all manner of internet games were being played. As the time progressed, however, I came to see that my decision to study such a broad category and to cut across a number of different games was deliberate, born of my desire to study what I call the topography of digital gaming in urban China. So, and I wanna just stop here and let this be a warning to everyone that although digital games occupy a central position in my work, my study is not so much about life within the games as it is about the social relations, imaginaries, and discourses that flow through and around them. Now, what I did not bargain for was that a number of the young gamers I was going to encounter in the cafes, dormitories, and apartments that I visited were going to deny that they played internet or Wang Bo games at all. And this declaration completely clashed with my own perceptions about the games these young people were playing. I observed them sitting at computers, logging onto games through internet servers, and engaging in multiplayer game scenarios with gamers in another room, another dormitory, or even another province. So how was it possible that these games that they were playing were not internet games? So I'm going to address this question in a moment, but the boundary work inherent in the claim that some games played via the internet are not internet games, epitomizes the kind of discursive processes that are the central concern of my research. And as noted by game scholar T.L. Taylor, these gaps in meaning are the places in which different definitions become problematized or previously hidden practices are accounted for. So to understand the topography of digital game culture in China, and the reason why some young people would reject the title of internet gamer, we must begin by understanding how digital games have been framed in dominant government and media discourse. Now, recall those seas of young men playing Counter-Strike in internet cafes in 2002. Well, not long after I left Harbin, two important things happened that charted a very divergent course for these gamers and popular understandings of their play. First, on June 17, 2002, shortly after I had embarked on my first foray into fieldwork, two teenage boys, disgruntled at being ejected from their late night gaming session, intentionally set a fire in an internet cafe in Beijing. This incident killed 25 people, many of them teenage boys, and it became what media scholar Henry Jenkins has called the Chinese Columbine, in that it set off this wave of regulations and accusations about the harmful effects of digital games. Officials in China started making very bold claims. In 2005, a deputy of the National, Pe National People's Congress, Li Quinan, was stating publicly that nearly 15% of China's middle school students were internet addicts. And on November 8th, 2008, China became the first country in the world to designate internet addiction a clinical disorder. But at the same time as concerns about internet addiction were on the rise, there was also a growing recognition that digital games involve skill and that they could be played competitively. And in 2003, the Chinese government designated competitive gaming, known in Chinese as Tianzi Jingji or eSports, as China's 99th professional competitive sport. At the time, China following South Korea was one of the very first countries to officially recognize professional esports. And since Tianzi Jingji became an official sport, the Chinese government has made somewhat reserved efforts to legitimize it and call attention to it as a source of national pride and goodwill. For example, Sky, a professional gamer, who you see here, carried the Olympic torch through Hainan province as, it's made, as it made its way to Beijing in 2008. So in thinking back to these teenagers that I first observed playing Counter-Strike in the cafes in 2002, the question then became, what distinguishes an internet addict from an esports athlete? Now, Unfortunately for gamers, in the early years, internet games and internet addiction received far more press coverage than esports. Between 2005 and 2010, 
newspaper coverage of the topic of internet addiction outstripped coverage of other social problems such as drug addiction, gambling addiction, and alcoholism. And in this coverage, internet gaming was the activity that was most closely associated with causing internet addiction. The press also used highly stylized images to depict gamers as zombies who played to the point of unresponsiveness. These images in the press perpetuated one of the greatest myths of digital media use. And that is the notion that time online is a socially isolating and altogether passive activity. Gazing as we are at these blank faces, we are led to believe that rather than engaging with friends or taking part in productive leisure pursuits, these youngsters are wasting away before the computer screen. And in such depictions, youths lack agency, becoming slaves to the technology itself. Now, this disproportionate and sens sensational coverage amounted to what I call a media moral panic about the subject of internet addiction in China. And I do want to note here that in calling China's response to internet addiction a moral panic, I'm not trying to insinuate that there was no such thing as problematic internet use. Uh, indeed, in the course of my fieldwork, I have met many young people who profess to having spent days on end playing games in internet cafes. But what I want to say is that from a sociological perspective, it's also really important that we note that concepts of addiction change over time and as a result of numerous cultural and political factors. To a certain extent, we can understand that the unstated aim of efforts to curb addiction is to control citizens' behavior in ways that are desired by those in power. Now, one of the places that we can see this social construction of addiction is through a close analysis of the kind of language that gets used to discuss the problem. And one very telling metaphor used by the press is that of spiritual opium or jing shen ya pian. This phrase, which has a long history of use in China, is very ideologically loaded in that it compares a phenomenon that the older generation does not understand, internet and games, and it relates it to a national embarrassment that none will soon forget, opium. Here's an illustration of how the term gets used in relation to the internet and games. The original intention of most internet users is to gather information and broaden their horizons. However, spurred on by a novelty seeking mentality, the inability to resist games and other temptations, as well as graphics and language that cause the face to flush and the heart to race, they lose self-control. Over the course of time, they play to the point of forgetting, they abandon themselves to not thinking and learning, and they become captives of spiritual opium. Now, there are a number of parallels between the history of opium use and the rise of the internet in China, not least of which pertains to the Chinese nation standing in the world and in relation to Western imperialism, both military and cultural. Now, far from simply casting the internet as something negative, this label, reflects deep-seated anxieties about the nation and about the Chinese government's ability to regulate youth in the face of a growing tide of foreign influence. But if we probe this comparison even further, we can also discover how the discourse of internet addiction, like the discourse of opium addiction in late 19th century Shanghai, conceals issues of nationalism, class, and economics. Indeed, Far from being perceived solely as a scourge on the nation, historian Alexander Desforges explains how in late 19th century Shanghai, opium use was also an accepted form of leisure and sociality. He notes that opium at the time was subject to a double discursive construction, whereby it was seen alternately as a means of replenishing the spirit, here's that word jing shen again, and of depleting it. In its positive form, opium smoking was an activity that could compensate for the spiritually draining process of labor. So if labor is the expenditure of one's spirit in exchange for money, then opium smoking is expending money in exchange for a substance and activity that could replenish the spirit. In its negative form, the balance is disrupted through wasteful excess as the addict disregards his labor to give in solely to the temptation of consuming opium. 
Importantly, however, Desforges notes that this double-edged discourse grew out of class anxiety. Opium smoking was, as he says, a practice that could be more or less dangerous depending on one's wealth and self-control. Scholar Yang Ren Zhang draws a similar conclusion, arguing that opium is the perfect example of the political redefinition of consumption. When the rich smoked it, it was cultured and a status symbol. And when the poor began to inhale, opium smoking became degrading and ultimately criminal. Now used in the right contexts by the right people, opium use was not seen as harmful, but used in wrong contexts by the wrong people, it was dangerous. This I contend is a perfect parallel to the way that internet cafes and internet gaming have been depicted in the media by the government and even by young people who I interviewed. Now, as I previewed in my introduction, the Chinese government and media began cultivating very early on a kind of double discursive construction of games as either addictive or athletic. Indeed, the internet as a whole has been consistently described as a double-edged sword. Um, one party member, for example, says that at the same time that the internet is a treasure trove of information, it is also a garbage pit and a trash heap. And in 2007, CNNIC, uh, the same body that usually gathers statistics about internet use, also invoked the metaphor of the double-edged sword. They recognized on one hand, the huge economic potential of the games industry, and on the other hand, cautioned that many gamers had submersed themselves in games, this habit that adversely affected their ability to function normally at work, in school, or in everyday life. So let me return briefly to my opium comparison here. In 19th century Shanghai, this fortress notes that many opium dens were luxurious establishments, described by one writer at the time as a world of glass, a cosmos of pearls and jade that dazzles the eye and sets the heart racing. However, as opium became more widely, widely available and started to filter down through the classes, opium dens and smoke shops as public places of consumption also began to cater to lower classes, ultimately earning a reputation for being dirty and dangerous. And something very similar is going on with internet cafes. Scholar Jack Chiu paints a picture of the changing social status of the internet cafe in early 21st century China. He notes, 10 years ago, it was called Huang Luo Cafe Wu, meaning literally network coffee house, a place of enlightenment, culture, and taste for the brainy and foreign minded. But 10 years later, it became Huang Ba or net bar. The short term succinctly signifies the loss of its elite appeal and descent into a working class ICT, end quote. Now, while I had arrived in China early enough to witness the golden age of internet cafes, by 2009, when I returned to conduct my dissertation fieldwork um, and the research that in fact became the basis for this book, this change in class understanding of the internet cafe was already acutely evident. At the time, my local advisor, a faculty member at the Shanghai Academy of Social Sciences, was pushing me to turn my attention away from internet cafes and internet addiction to the subject of educational games for elementary school children. And indeed, as I say in my book, her very attempt to dissuade me from investigating the stigma of internet addiction and internet gaming served only to flag internet addiction as a point of contention among the Chinese scholarly community. And thus, she further ignited my curiosity in the topic. And so when I approached this advisor for help in locating an undergraduate student who played digital games to act as my assistant, she produced a young man who I will call Luke. Luke was a sophomore majoring in sociology at Tongji University, and he was an A student, but he did not play internet games, frequent internet cafes, or indeed express any interest in taking on gaming as a new hobby. And at first I lamented what I felt was my bad luck at having what seemed at the time like one of the only young men in all of Shanghai who did not play digital games as my research assistant. But ultimately Luke played an integral role in helping me see the ways in which dominant understandings of digital gaming were being negotiated among youth. So over the course of the next year, 
Luke and I interviewed numerous Shanghai-based college students about their experiences playing digital games. And many, if not all of them, confessed at the time to having essentially grown up in the early 2000s playing games in internet cafes. The space of the internet cafe was a space of youth sociality for them. And it was a particularly important space in the stressful years leading up to the college entrance exam. Numerous students talked to me nostalgically about the cafe's chifen or atmosphere and recalled fondly the time spent there with friends playing games. As one Fudan University student I interviewed explained, when you are in high school, studies are extremely intense. And so school won't allow for any internet in the dormitories. We didn't have a television, we had nothing, just a dorm. So therefore you had to go to an internet cafe. However, in retrospect, when talking to these students in 2009, 2010, um, many of them noted that beyond their exciting atmosphere and usefulness as respite from intense studies, the internet cafe also had a darker side. So Ling Ling, and a student from East China Normal University, noted there are two main kinds of internet cafes. One is a kind for students, and another kind is all those society youth, those society youth will just sit there and smoke and use the internet. And here it's worth noting that her term society is not like high society, but rather more like townie. Um, another student, Bei Bei, a Tongji University student who eschewed internet cafes altogether, uh, echoed the sentiment. He said, I'm a bit repulsed by internet cafes because the interior is so chaotic. There's lots of people smoking and then inside, um, well, there are people of so many different professions. Sometimes there's fighting incidents, sometimes there's identity theft, they're not very safe places. So in short, college students' reminiscences and descriptions of time spent gaming in the internet cafe reveal the cafe's contradictory position as both an important social gathering space and a space marked by stigma and disrepute. Like the discourse of opium in 19th century Shanghai, playing games in the cafe could be interpreted as a way to replenish the spirit after a hard day of studying for the Gaokao or the entrance exam, but staying too long in the cafe, like staying too long in the opium den, was attributed to the diminished work ethic and lack of self-control seen most commonly in working class youth. Presumably, these society youth, as Ling Ling calls them, will never leave the internet cafe for a better life or better leisure, but will continue to stagnate like addicts in these smoke-filled dens. So turning away from the public space of the cafe to the subject of games themselves, I found in my research that a similar dual logic was at play. Now you'll recall that I mentioned in my introduction that many of the gamers I interviewed denied that they played internet games. Well, let me relate in a little bit more detail exactly how I became aware of this distinction. So one of the students that my assistant Luke introduced me to was his friend Xiaomei. Xiaomei was a young woman majoring in finance. She aspired to study business in the United States. And the first time we met, I asked her what type of internet game, Wang Luo Yoshi, she most likely she most liked to play. And she responded by saying that she did not play internet games. So confused, I probed further. Well, okay, what were the names of the games that she did like to play? And she responded by saying that she usually played Mo Shou. Now, in my mind, I automatically associated this with the MMORPG World of Warcraft, Mo Shou Shi Jie. Now, this is the game you see being played in this picture. But as it turned out, Xiao Mei was referring to a different game, the RTS game, World of Warcraft, Mo Shou Zheng Ba. Now, beyond my initial confusion about the name of the game that Xiao Mei was playing, it was her insistence that Warcraft 3 was not a Wang Bo or internet game that especially intrigued me. Instead, Xiaomei classified Warcraft 3 as a Danji game. Now, bear with me as I take a brief detour into the nuances of Chinese language here. So the literal translation of Danji is single computer or single device. Oh, and sorry, hold on, I just lost all my notes because um, my screen is trying to install an update. Okay, here we go. So it's a single de uh, device, 
right? Uh, this is a game like a local area uh, network game, like a PC game. Um, and typically these games can be played without the use of an internet connection. But the use of this term is somewhat misleading here because rarely are such games actually played in a single computer or LAN scenario. In fact, Xiaomi, like most of the others I would meet, played Warcraft 3 on an online server with friends located in different parts of the campus, city, or even country. So what should be evident enough by now is that the shunning of the label internet game, like the shunning of the internet cafe, was yet another telling indication of the dominant cultural construction of internet games and their harmful effects. Given the association of internet games with spiritual opium, many of the young college students I spoke with labored vigorously, if subconsciously, to demarcate and defend their leisure choices from attack. So instead of aligning their play with internet games, Xiaomei and her friends associated their playing of danji games with esports or dianzi team tea. And the distinctions they were making had a lot to do with judgments about the kinds of social interaction, the level of competition, skills, and the investment of time and money that these different game genres were presumed to entail. Put simply, they believed that Wang Luo or internet games were addictive, whereas the games they played were based on skill, they were athletic. Now, perhaps not surprisingly, I found that the students' talking points were mirrored in the rhetoric of government officials. Take, for example, a municipal official who opened an esports tournament in Beijing by declaring Dianzi Jingji is a sport. It must be strictly separated from Wang Luo games. Now, some of you in the audience may dispute this, but here I'd like to suggest that despite the effort to separate there's these games, there really isn't, in fact, all that much that separates an RTS game like Warcraft 3 from an MMORPG like World of Warcraft. And I can talk more about why I feel that way uh, if you want to dispute it. Um, but my own opinion is aside, the manager of an esports team in China agreed with me, stating, by nature, they're all games. You can't make lofty statements about how esports should be separated from internet games. So in constructing the somewhat false binary between internet games and esports, addicts and athletes, the college students I spoke with were engaging in a kind of ideological labor that mirrored the double discursive construction of games in government and media discourse. What is more, the way that these college students described their gaming habits aligned quite closely with models of ideal citizenship that were being championed by the Chinese state. They portrayed their gaming habits as what I call a form of patriotic leisure that very much followed a socialist yet neoliberal logic of skill building, professionalism, and individual competition in the name of the nation. Here, I take my patriotic leisure term as an extension of the work of Lisa Hoffman. And though I don't have time to elaborate, Hoffman traces models of ideal citizenship as they developed in pre and post socialist China, from the Confucian gentleman to the communist model worker to the late socialist neoliberal model of the patriotic professional. And in my own research, I was able to see how students were extending that notion of professionalism to their leisure, arguing that the games taught them about the time, effort, and self-discipline necessary to become competitive individuals in life, not just in the confines of the game. Now, as my time in Shanghai progressed, I became increasingly certain that my interviews with college student gamers were presenting me with a fairly narrow vision of digital game culture in Shanghai. And my suspicions were confirmed when I met Liang, a researcher who studied digital gaming trends for an international consulting firm. Now, Liang was an avid, avid gamer himself. And the first time I spoke with him about my research with college students, he laughed at me. He just laughed in my face. And he told me that in the months of fieldwork, I had yet to speak to a real internet gamer. So he set out to fix this problem and introduced me to a handful of young men and women who devoted themselves to games. Though they were roughly the same age as the university students that I had interviewed, many of these young people were either already working or they were engaged in studies at local vocational schools. So one was studying chain store management, one was an entry level employee at a local media business, and one worked odd jobs to make ends meet. Now, I was not surprised to hear 
that these particular gamers argued that Wang Luo games also involved skill and strategy. And there was, however, one sort of sharp point of distinction. And that was the way in which these young people made sense of their attachment to games. In particular, I found that they consistently emphasized their belief that games fulfilled a spiritual or emotional need. Now, recall once again that opium was framed as something that could, in addition to depleting one's energy or spirit, also invigorate it. And this is exactly the kind of argument that was advanced by the so-called real internet gamers uh, that Liang introduced me to. So take, for example, one young man who said the following. Maybe your real life is not how you imagined it to be. Take, for example, a boy who's not very good looking in real life. He isn't anyone extraordinary. He doesn't have much money. But after he plays the game, he can pretend. He can forget the jokes others tell about him in real life. He can completely forget all the things he is unsatisfied with. This imaginary space gives me some satisfaction. Now, this perspective, which I heard echoed again and again, was also reinforced through a fan-made video that was sent to me by one of the college students I had interviewed. By way of explanation, Xiao Long, the young man who sent me the link, said, this is a movie that speaks to the emotions in many World of Warcraft players' hearts. Now, Xiao Long, and like the young man who I just quoted previously, um, as well as the characters that appear in this film that I'm gonna talk about were of internet addiction, suffer from a feeling of nostalgia for a spiritual homeland, a jingshan jiayuan, that seemingly does not exist, but for in the virtual reality of the game. Now, some of you may be familiar with this now decade old film. Uh, it garnered much attention at the time of its release. But for those of you who haven't heard of it, let me offer a very brief synopsis. War of Internet Addiction is a machinima. It's an in-game movie that's made using the game engine and the set and the avatars as actors. The plot is extremely intricate. It's stuffed with references of government censorship, corporate battles over licensing and operation of the game, of the game World of Warcraft, and villains that are modeled after real life figures such as an internet addiction specialist who notoriously used electroconvulsive therapy to treat unwilling patients. Though some predicted that this video would be censored in China, it in fact was a viral success. More importantly, the movie advanced this argument that the virtual space of the game was a spiritual homeland, one that cultivated a sense of community and friendship among those who played. Let me read a, a clip from it. The fil film's hero lays out his argument. You are always claiming that we are addicted to World of Warcraft. You're right, we're addicted. But what we are addicted to is not the game, it is the sense of belonging the game has given us. We're addicted to the friends and the feelings of the past four years, addicted to four years of caring and love. Now, in explicitly constructing the game space as a spiritual homeland, these gamers were confronting head on the claim that games were a form of spiritual opium in the negative sense of the term. The film also makes profound statements about the way that citizens find their spirit drained by the realities of life in contemporary China. The film's hero wails, this past year, we like all other World of Warcraft lovers have earnestly taken public transportation to work, earnestly consumed all kinds of goods, no matter whether they contain unknown chemicals. We didn't complain because of our low wages, didn't complain because you took taxes out of our meager earnings. We lived in these cramped apartments despite our feelings of despair. Now, within this film, the Chinese government's refusal to release an expansion of the game World of Warcraft is used as a metaphor for the lack of mobility in real life. The hero describes the bleak scene that Chinese gamers faced inside World of Warcraft when they reached the ed edge of the map where the new expansion should have awaited them. This year, each time we arrived at Undercity, we would see the empty, empty Zeppelin Tower across from us. This year, even though we knew it was impossible, we swam northward, ignoring fatigue, swam to the edge of the map, swam to the edge of the sea, but we still could not see that frozen land. Now, though I haven't addressed it directly, it is really important to note that throughout this presentation, I have been talking about young people who were for the most part, part of China's only child generation. 
those young people faced intense pressure to achieve a narrowly defined version of success. And their mobility was restricted in numerous ways, be it through the HUCO or residence permit system, the lack of job prospects, or increasingly unaffordable housing costs. So games in these instances became an alternative means of acting out this desire for mobility, a desire that they found difficult to fulfill in everyday life. And so while the college students I encountered had argued unequivocally that games could be used in pursuit of upward socioeconomic mobility, these gamers found that games provided an alternative kind of mobility, what I call sideways mobility. Now, sideways mobility is propelled by a sense of disillusionment with one's surroundings, a longing for an alternative utopia. It can be a kind of defense mechanism during a time of rapid change, and it can be a source of continuity and movement in an otherwise fragmented and immobile existence. Those who embrace what I call sideways mobility have become spiritually unstitched from a society where they have not been able to grow up in the ways deemed important by models of ideal citizenship. Now in China, this could mean they lack a house, the car, the job, the spouse, any or all of these contemporary markers of successful adulthood. Instead of moving up, these young people had no choice but to move sideways. Now, in recent years, the sense of disillusionment existing on the internet and within digital game culture has grown even more distinct. Many of you may be familiar with a slang term that grew quite popular in China in the last decade, diaosu. Now in my book, I devote one of my final chapters to discussing the diaosu phenomenon, which though many failed to realize it, was initially closely associated with digital gaming culture. Presumably the same young people who were wasting their time playing games in internet cafes also identified as diaosu. And for those of you who aren't familiar with this term, the rough translation of it is loser. Uh, a crude literal translation of the term, which is borrowed from the Cantonese, would actually be dick hair or pubic hair. And the interesting thing about Diao Si, which has captured the attention of many China scholars, is that the label, though seemingly created as an insult, has been embraced by individuals throughout Chinese society. And those who claim this label are proud of being Diao Si, and they shout their loser identity with gusto. Now, there are a number of similar Chinese idioms on the internet today, from sang wanhua to tangping or lying flat. And for the purposes of time, I'm not going to be able to delve into the origins and nuances of these terms, but I merely wish to say that the dielsa identity, which has been so embraced by many gamers, negotiates these dominant understandings of what it means to be successful in Chinese society. And implicit in this dielsa culture is a critique of the heteronormative notion of upward mobility outlined by these neoliberal models of patriotic professionalism and patriotic leisure. The Diao Se implicitly chafe at what queer theorist Jack Halberstam has called heteronormative common sense. Heteronormative common sense, quote, leads to the equation of success with advancement, capital accumulation, family and ethical conduct and hope. By contrast, Halberstam embraces queer failure, noting that this form of counter hegemonic common sense revolves around failure as nonconformity, anti capitalist practices, non reproductive lifestyles, negativity, and critique. So for Halberstam, there's power in aligning oneself with failure, and this is precisely what the losers do. Now, there are many ambiguities in the Dielsa identity, and I can't explore these here, but the important takeaway is that this identity is closely aligned with the kinds of sideways mobility that I explained were embraced by the so-called real gamers and through this film, War of Internet Addiction. Implicit in this stance is the reclaiming of passivity as a form of agency, of addiction, or at least immersion in games, as a meaningful source of spiritual nourishment. So as I hope to have demonstrated today, digital gaming culture fosters effective experiences that are sometimes at odds with and sometimes aligned with dominant cultural representations. What is more, digital games are subject to a double discursive construction, whereby they're framed as something with both positive benefits and negative consequences. 
However, often the difference between the healthy leisure pursuit and an unhealthy game addiction has more to do with factors related to class and power than anything biological. In conclusion, I would like to stress that the vast majority of gamers I spoke to in the course of my nearly two decades of studying this topic were neither addicts nor athletes, but rather simply young people grappling with the effects of a dominant discourse that cast their leisure choices as wasteful and harmful. Far from seeing games as such, most of the young people I spoke to saw games as related to the challenge of everyday life and their mobility or lack thereof within contemporary Chinese society. So thank you very much. That brings me to the end of my talk. I wanna share with you um, before I open it up to questions, some suggestions for further reading that I've compiled. And I know that uh, Professor Dale has said that she will also be sending these out in an email uh, after the talk. So at this point, uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and um, we can open it up for questions. Thank you.